everyone. Welcome back to the Earth Dawn Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we'll be... We will be discussing all things quizzical because we haven't done this in a long, long time. Uh, so if you have any questions for us, by all means, drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we have one listener who dropped us like four emails, so he's going to take up the vast majority of the show, but I'm going to break them up a little bit. So, Josh, they're mostly welcome short back. with like one question. I'm sorry, what was that, Dan? Welcome back. Welcome back. Yes. I had enjoyable time with the production that we did. It went well. I really enjoyed being back on stage again. I did not have stress or butterflies or stage fright or anything like that on any of the performances. I oh, made a kick-ass headless horseman, <laughs> among other things. I loved your costume. Yeah. Very well done. The good news that came out of that I was telling Dan about before we hit record after the show wrapped, I got a, a message from the artistic director of the local semi-pro theater company saying, hey, I really enjoyed uh, your work in that production. Would you like to understudy for a couple of roles in an upcoming production we're doing in February of Dial M for Murder? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that would be yeah. awesome. That's not that's that there's no hesitation on that answer. Yeah. So. I'm just understudying. I'm not sure how much of my time is actually going to end up be dedicated to that. But the fact that this person that I don't know saw me for the first time and was like, oh, there's somebody that I want to bring in with. really, really made my actor's heart sing after having been so long, not in a actual Acting performance. Role having the justification and the recognition of my work. Yeah. was really, really nice. Oh, no. Always good to be appreciated. So anyway, uh, that is several weeks down the road. If things change, we'll let you folks know. We do appreciate you coming back. We've got emails that did accumulate during that downtime. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting into be getting into things up on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first up is a listener, Michael. So he has got a bunch of questions here. We're going to get to all three of his emails and we'll just run down the list of what Michael has to, has to, uh, questions on. So to Josh about the care and feeding of spirits slash elementals, my ninth circle elementalist character, third edition, eventually we will get around to porting that campaign over to fourth has since Circle 2 or 3, carried a staff with a Rank 3 Earth Elemental, either bound to or simply dwelling within, that I can call on once a day with no summoning test required. It occurs to me I've never asked if it's there of its own free will. I should remedy that. In the rules I have read, there does not seem to be any way to increase an Elemental's strength intentionally. There seems to be a mechanic for them to gain strength as a negative consequence of a failed summoning roll, but how do I deliberately buff up my constant, dependable companion as I advance, considering I've never had to summon it and therefore never failed a test? There isn't any in the mechanics way to deliberately increase the strength rating of a spirit, whether in third or fourth edition. One of the things that is in the back of my brain as a change to the way that summoned spirits work for elementalists and nethermancers and, and shaman in fourth mm -hmm. edition is to treat them like animal, the, similar to the way that animal companions are handled for Beastmasters, yeah. that it is a, a, a particular individual that you call up and have an ongoing relationship with and that could potentially grow and, and such as part of your character's advancement. If the strength rating of the spirit in question is now out of whack of the relative power mm -hmm. of the campaign, you said you've had it since novice circles, you're now yeah. in circle nine. It may be that the spirit is now, relatively speaking, several ranks below where you are in terms of what it is capable of doing, I would probably handle it 
in the game as just something that I, as the GM, would grant strength rating to it. Certainly at this point of things. Where it's part of an item, the relationship of the spirit to the item in question, whether it is literally bound to it in some capacity or whether that's just kind of where it's hanging out, maybe makes a little bit of a difference. If it's a thread item, you would probably be looking at something where the ranks of the item are tied to the spirit's story in some capacity. There's a um, sword, I think it's called Night Scar that has appeared since the the earliest days that has a nethermantic spirit bound to it, possibly relate to it there. But at this point, especially if the spirit were lower in power compared to everything else that was going on, I, as a GM, would probably just grant it some additional strength rating. Possibly, depending on how things are going, have that be connected to a story arc or uh, adventure, a minor story arc in the campaign, to have that sort of be one of the rewards of completing that story. But to answer the base question, there is no real dedicated way within the rules to enhance the strength rating. Fair enough. Next question from Michael. About shield bash and shield drive the knack that goes underneath the talent shield bash in episode 43 email palooza two or three you mentioned that shield bash does damage and knocks enemies down and i have to say that until you said so i did not get an indication that the talent does actual damage from the description in the player's guide as written i interpreted it as if you succeed in a melee combat attack you can choose to use shield bash in place of your weapon's damage roll and the result minus armor, is the enemy's targoid knockdown. Not, if you succeed, you can choose to use shield bash in place of your weapon's damage roll, and the enemy takes that much damage, plus uses the result as their target number for knockdown. You may wish to make that distinction clearer in upcoming errata. I'm looking at the description of shield bash, page 166 of the, of the player's guide. This is the current version of the player's guide. The Adept replaces their normal damage test with Shield Bash with physical armor reducing the result. It seems fairly clear to me that that means that it is doing damage, that you're just using Shield Bash as the step that you roll for damage instead of what you would normally roll with your strength plus the weapon damage step, because the shield doesn't, isn't a weapon, doesn't actually have a weapon damage step. And so... It seems fairly clear to me. I can perhaps understand why mm-hmm. there might be some confusion on that, but that's not something that has actually changed at all in any version. That's kind of always yeah. been the way that Shield Bash has worked. And the second sentence is the target of the tech makes a knockdown test. So right. But yeah. I think what he's saying is that it didn't seem clear to him that replacing the normal damage test means that you are still rolling damage. Mm -hmm. But it also says, you know, using the damage dealt as the difficulty number. So it is dealing damage. It seems fairly clear to me that there is enough phrasing within the rules on that, that that it is doing damage in addition to forcing the knockdown test. Yeah, I have... This is like one of those many, many cases in the rules where you read something... If something doesn't quite make sense, or you make an assumption based on the phrasing about the way that it works, yeah. and then you go and you talk to other people mm-hmm. about it, and you realize that they have a completely different interpretation yep. of that very same language oh, that you the... do. I still run into that today. Somebody will ask a question and will be like, well, what about... I'm like, I had never thought of it that way mm-hmm. before. It's the vagaries of language. Yeah. So... I I am certainly not intending to talk down or or denigrate or make light of Michael's confusion with this. It's just the way that it's written seems fairly clear to me because it is talking about damage dealt, because it is talking about replacing the normal damage test with this. Yeah, because you're using the shield as a weapon. It is dealing damage as well as causing the knockdown test. Mm -hmm. No argument here. Um, 
he goes on further, the clarified interpretation does make the shield drive knack make some sense, at least. At first read, it looked absolutely identical to the shield bash talent it is supposedly a knack for, but now it looks like if you use shield drive, you are only knocking the enemy down, not hurting them. Is this an accurate read, or did I miss something in that description? Shield drive is a knack in the companion at page 103. Mm -hmm. Bashes their target with their shield and makes a shield drive test against target because of once if successful, the target makes a knockdown test against the shield drive results. I think the important thing about shield drive, what shield drive does is allows you to force the knockdown with your shield, but it doesn't require the prerequisite of the melee weapons attack test mm. ahead of time. Fair. That you could still do shield drive to force the knockdown test and then still make a regular attack with your sword or axe or whatever, yeah. if that's what you wanted to do. Remember, with shield bash, you make a normal melee weapons test against the physical defense, mm -hmm. and then the shield bash replaces the damage test. The phrasing on shield drive says that you make a shield drive test against the target's physical defense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shield drive kind of makes it work the way that people always thought shield bash used to work, Fair. which was that shield bash was the attack test, not right. the damage test. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's the difference here is that with shield drive, that is, it's a simple action. So it, but it's, it is the attack test in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why it doesn't do damage. It just forces the knockdown yeah. because then you could also make an attack with melee weapons or whatever in order to deal damage to the target. Yeah, because... That's the distinction there. Yeah, because shield drive is the simple action, a regular attack test would be a standard action. Right, right. Yeah. That's the main difference, is that shield bash is a damage replacement talent, mm -hmm. whereas shield drive is just, I'm going to try and knock this person down. It allows you to make a knockdown test without... Or to force a knockdown test without requiring an, a deliberately declared attack to knockdown or, you know, something along those lines. It's just a, a simple yeah. action that you can get in there as an additional thing that you could do during your turn. Fair. Uh, it's part of the reason why it's, at, why it's available at rank six. You need to be good enough with shield bash at that point to kind of just have it be its thing. To be its own little knockdown thing. So uh, yeah. the last final, the final question on this point uh, how is this different from the attack to knockdown game mechanic? From the text in the books, all three seem interchangeable, to be honest. Okay, so one, the attack to knockdown option can be performed with anything, not just a shield. shield. Chair, you can try sword, and attempt to knock bow. down with a sword, with a spear, with a great axe, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. The regular attack to knock down talent option, you do away with dealing any damage. In that case, all you are doing is generating the target number for the knockdown test. Yeah. You are attempting to knock down the target. You are not attempting to hurt them. Yeah. It's like a leg sweep. Shield bash allows you to both deal damage and force the knockdown test. Mm -hmm. That's so. why it's better at those low circles than just the simple attack to knock down option. Because it's a talent. You can use karma on it. That's why it does both. Right. Because it is a talent. You could roll karma on that test. Yeah. And because it's got a rank that adds in, it can conceivably like end up with a higher step number than you might have with your regular weapon. But the big thing for shield bash is that it allows both damage and forces the knockdown test whereas the regular attack to knockdown just does the knockdown test it doesn't deal any damage at all yeah so that's the big difference there then what shield bash as i kind of or shield drive rather the knack mm -hmm. what that allows is that it allows an additional attack to knockdown with the shield as a simple action in addition to whatever standard action you might care to do Want to do yeah what you could do if you're high enough rank, you could open with shield drive to try and knock the target down mm -hmm. so that they then have a lowered physical defense where you then follow up to try and stab them with your sword. Yes. Those are like two separate things that you can do on your turn. Yeah. So the difference between... Normally the choice is deal damage 
or attack to knock down. Mm-hmm. Shield bash allows you to do both as the same action. Yeah. Shield drive allows you to do that attack to knock down as an additional action mm-hmm. on top of whatever you would normally be. I was going to say, that's the that's the main difference between the attack to knock down is your declared action, whereas shield drive is, it's a simple action and I get to do something else right. on top of that. And that's where you have to be at least rank six to get that done. So you've you've added some efficiency to your attacking. That's why it, it, it provides that at that level. Yeah. Clear as mud? I hope that's all clear. <laughs> I can understand the confusion on all yes. of that, especially if from the beginning you didn't realize that Shield Bash was doing more than what a simple attack to knock down allows. Yeah, because and because it's a talent, not just a declared action. The talent has to give you more than just the combat option. And so... Right. Yeah. It does two options and you can spend a point of karma on it, which at novice circles, since it's a damage replacement talent, you don't get many of those. Normally you can spend karma on your attack, but you don't get any bonus karma on damage unless you are a specific discipline. Yeah. Okay. On to air speaking. I'm glad this has been cleaned up for fourth edition. While playing my elementalist in third edition, I hated the fact that I had a discipline talent that I could never find a use case for. Since, in that edition, air speaking put your voice in the ear of everyone in range, enemies, bystanders, and party members alike. I might actually have used it from time to time if I could have limited it to just the people I wanted to talk to, like fourth edition. So, he's happy there. No, no comments from Josh need be. Okay. On to intimidating bellow. If I am reading this Nax description correctly, it has the exact same debuff effect on enemies as bog standard battle bellow, just without buffing your friends in the bargain. What possible use case could there be for that worth spending additional legend points on? Again, am I missing something about intimidating bellow compared to battle bellow? The main difference is that battle bellow has an increased difficulty number for each additional target. Oh, there you go. Battle Bellow is highest social defense among the target group, plus one for each additional target, which can be pretty significant if you are affecting Half a dozen. both enemies and allies within the area of effect. Yeah. Intimidating Bellow is just the highest social defense among the target group. And everybody else just kind of um, is umbrellaed underneath them. And everybody else is just umbrellaed underneath it. It does away with the buff to your allies, but it also reduces the difficulty number effectively for affecting a group of enemies. And remember that Battle Shout is against just a single target. So Battle Bellow is sort of the area effect. Intimidating Bellow makes it Battle Shout, but against a group without increasing the difficulty number based on how many people you're actually affecting. Fair. Okay. Anything else on those? Fair enough. Nope. Nothing comes Michael to has mind. more. We'll get back to him in a minute because somebody else popped in. And this is from Walter. Hi, Dan and Josh. He remembers our names. Yay. Uh, just listened to the episode on Kept in the Dark. Actually, this was the first adventure I ran with my group in third edition. The group, cons- he has a story to tell, so he has some highlights, but they are uh, character-specific, so here's the fun part. So this group consists of Shark Elementalist, Tween Ar- Akarak, the Tuskrang Warrior, uh, Lilithi, the Windling Illusionist, and Thea Quirina, Dwarf Troubadour slash Sage. The highlights were the use of animal lore by Thea, the Dwarf Troubadour, uh, about the Brithen being likely to accept a defeat in single combat and Tween rushing forward, defeating it in single combat and being very happy about saving the rest of the group the trouble of doing so. Uh, second highlight, the contact with the jungle to Scrang, in which Tween immediately declared that he was taking the blood oath not to talk about their location. And during role-playing, the characters talked about their experience with different climate Shirag was talking about ice and snow unknown to the jungle inhabitants. So they spent some time skating on icy surfaces cast by her with memorable high and low dexterity rolls, adding some comic relief. I'm personally am imagining like Looney Tunes cartoons with, with people on ice for the first time. Uh, that's just me. Uh, third highlight, Sherog, the orc elementalist, got attacked by a death moth, which really made her angry due to pestering her for a longer time. 
dice results can be fun. When she finally smacked her to the ground, she jumped on the foul insect several times, fueled by anger, triggered some wily coyote pictures there as well. Uh, and the fourth highlight, Lilifi, the windling illusionist, uh, using monstrous mental in the encounter with the Therans more as a deterrent than actually engaging them, while Tween was able to win the duel. Overall, the jungle theme was enjoyed very much, and the different factors, noisy nights, rain torrents, poisonous what you want, insects, and so on, might have been a nuisance to the characters, but less to the players. And there was no debate whether the group would help Rankar or not. Even his generous financial offer did not sway them a second, and they left him to his fate at the hands of the jungle and its inhabitants. Best regards, sir. <laughs> That's a great story. Me too. I love Tales from the Those Table like that. Bring him on. Let's get some more. Please, please, please send all those you can to us. Uh, okay, back to more questions. This is from Mark. By the way, Mark is a PhD. So we have somebody who actually is playing this game smarter than both of us put together. Just going to say that right now. Uh, hi, as a former player from the 90s who hasn't played Earthon since then, I am excited to venture into the fourth edition setting for the first time. Well, you've been getting a PhD, so by all means, welcome back to the table. I wanted to thank you for your great podcast that has helped immensely in getting my bearings. I'm only just scratching the surface of your podcast, so apologies if this is covered someplace already. If so, can you direct me to the right podcast episode? I have always wanted to run a game involving the crew of the Earth Dawn, so I wanted your opinion on how you would imagine these adepts would have been able to contact people inside the CARE about the colonization of Barsave. I assume CARES don't have a doorbell. My thanks, Mark. Welcome back, Mark. We have not actually covered that before. However... It's actually answered how they would have potentially done that. There are two spells that were presented in, oh, I forget Is what arcane, book, but they first showed Mysteries? up in first edition. Yeah. Rings a bell. It might be in Arcane Mysteries is most likely is where knocking? they are because they weren't in the original core book. Mm. Yeah. Care knocking and care pictographs were yeah. the two spells that were created. Mm -hmm. They're both wizard spells, as I seem to recall. One of them, Care Knocking, is intended to interact with the wards on a care yes. to basically make a doorbell-like <laughs> sound. Let people inside the care know that somebody is outside and trying to get in touch with them. And then Care Pictographs allows them to communicate written word style through the wards of the care to communicate with the people inside once they have had a chance to do so. I'm pretty sure that at least one, if not both of those, reappeared in Magic Deeper Secrets. Care Knocking is on page 335, and Care Pictographs is on page 336. Nice. They're not spells now. They are both knacks off of thread weaving. Oh, cool. So that, any, any magic... Yeah. Any yeah, magic. so conceivably... Adapt. Any adept would be able to do that. Yeah. What's the rank on those for thread weaving? Care knocking requires rank three. Care pictographs requires rank five and care knocking. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. <clears throat> but yeah, those are both now in fourth edition in Deeper Secrets. That was something that was built into the rites of protection and passage to allow exactly that sort of communication. Yeah. That makes sense. No, I, li I like seeing those spells as they came up. I've never had a chance to use them, but I liked them. And I like them even better now that they're just knacks under thread weaving, because that way anybody can do it. You don't have to actually send off to go get a wizard if there's not a wizard in your party. But cool. I look forward to you actually telling us the tale about how you ran this adventure of the Earth Dawn, because I don't think that's been done yet. At least not that I've ever come across. All right. Cool. What's next? Uh, next, we have one from Simon. Hi, guys. I am still making my way through the podcast catalog, so I apologize if this question has been addressed post where I am up to. Considering the post-COVID and future world of tabletop RPGs, is virtual tabletop, and that is probably even more vital to, for games with smaller communities like Earth Dawn, which is really, really unfortunate as it's my favorite RPG, is there going to be serious development for Foundry in the future? I have recently purchased several Foundry products and feel quite nervous around the lack of development I see in support for the Foundry products. There are some very old, outdated tutorials, such as the wiki that comes with the Foundry compendium, and it's very sparse and has not been updated for a long time. Very few actually tutorial videos. 
I see there was supposed to be a series that appears abandoned on YouTube after only four were made several years ago. I love this game. I live in a tiny ass country. Yes, that's how we spell it, ass in my country, Australia. So finding Earth Dawn groups here is next to impossible, leaving my options to be mainly global via VTTs. I have played or game mastered Earth Dawn since first edition in 1998. Loved it more than any other. I love to see a new rise of popularity based upon the increased tabletop RPG popularity since COVID. But this surge is because of modern solutions like VTTs. Despite a love-hate relationship I have with VTTs, they are the future of gaming, whether we like it or not. Kind regards, Simon. So, a couple of things. The Foundry modules, as well as the equivalent compendia for Roll20, we have those available for both of those platforms. Those are sort of the two largest ones. Those are fan developed those are created and maintained by individuals who said hey i, I want to make these can you do something to sort of support or give your official stamp of approval or whatever yeah and so we have we sell the codes for the foundry ones through our shop we get mm -hmm. a cut of the price on that Development is ongoing for those. The The modules for Foundry are created as they get made. I know that the module, for example, for Deeper Secrets, mm -hmm. we provided both the Roll20 and Foundry folks with early versions of the book yeah. so that they could get started on having the data already in place so that they could make the modules available soon after the electronic version of the book was made available. Yeah, so it was like simultaneous release. So in terms of the actual production and support for the modules for the various books, that is something that is planned to continue as long as, uh, I think his name is, I think it's Christopher or JB. I forget who, who, which of the guys it is that's working on the Foundry version of that. JB. Is it JB? Okay. Yeah. As long as he continues to do it, we will provide him with the material to, to do so. As far as the tutorials and videos and stuff like that, I understand why there might not be so much uh, work that's done on those. The number of attempts that other folks have had to make supporting material for Earth Dawn, whether as part of the VTT or other stuff, it's a lot of work to do that, especially doing videos and and whatnot. He may just find that his time is better spent fixing bugs and developing the modules and so forth mm -hmm. around his regular schedule and not having the necessarily the time to to keep the documentation up to date. Yeah. I do know that if you go to the Foundry Discord, the Discord server that kind of supports the Foundry community, I'm pretty sure they might have a specific Earth Dawn channel in there to support that particular set. And JB is pretty easily reachable on that. And it may be something that, that you're better direct uh, directing a question to him about. And I'm sure if uh, you had questions he'd be happy to answer them if you were mm -hmm. willing to offer support in some way to help that stuff that you feel is lacking i'm sure he would welcome that but we recognize that vtt's are a way that earth dawn will see more play than it probably otherwise would these days and sure. we are going to continue supporting the modules we're just not directly involved in the production of them or the support of their documentation or anything like that fair no worries but uh again welcome back glad you're doing it and by all means let, me, let us know if you need anything else we can at least point you in the right direction onto the 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 foundry discord places the best place to start final follow-up questions from michael told you we'd come back to you michael here you are Follow-up question number one. If I own a thread weapon, but have not yet tied a thread to it, but I have more silver than legend points and get it forged, what happens to that bonus when I do tie the thread? How do the difficulty numbers interact? Okay. I think... Let me go back and just double check. 
but I'm pretty sure that it's straightforward. I just want to double check the way that forge blade, forge weapon works because I know like three different versions in my head and I want to make sure I'm using the card. Oh, I know. I got you there. Okay. So the difficulty number four forge weapon is completely independent of what the base damage of the weapon is. Right. The difficulty number is six plus the number of enhancements that it currently right. has. So let's say you've got a sword, a thread sword, a broadsword to keep Easy. things yeah. simple. Using it on its own without any thread attached is normally a damage step strength mm -hmm. plus five. If you then use forge weapon to give it, and as a result of the test on that, you end up getting a plus mm -hmm. two bonus from forging. The difficulty number for that initial test would be six. If you rolled an 11 or, you know, 11 to, mm -hmm. what, 15, you would get plus two. That would boost the damage from strength plus five to strength plus seven. And that would mean that the subsequent, any subsequent forging test that you might make on the weapon would be at six plus two, so eight, as the base difficulty number for yeah. any subsequent forge Just enhancement. Base. Because it's six plus the number of enhancements that yes. it has. It has a plus two, six plus two is eight. If you then have that broadsword with the plus two forging, so it's at strength plus seven, and you then weave a thread, the first thread rank, let's say, boosts the damage of the weapon from mm -hmm. strength plus five to strength plus six, it still has the plus two enhancement from forging. So it would go from being a base... Strength plus seven to strength plus eight. Tying your thread. You still get that plus one bonus from the thread as well as the plus two from the forging. That doesn't affect yeah. what the difficulty number for the forging is. Part of the reason that the target number for the forge is independent of the damage step is to make it so that the difficulty of forging an item, it doesn't make it easier to forge a dagger compared to a broadsword compared to a two-handed sword for example, that the base difficulty does not change for the forge test. So that's that's the answer, is that you get the bonuses from both places and you just follow the rules for forge weapon in terms of what the difficulty number is if you want to add additional forge bonuses atop whatever ones you might already have. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. I hope I said that clearly <laughs> enough. I think so, because as you said, the, the base difficulty to forge the weapon is independent of any other number about the weapon itself. So starting with that. Yeah. And you're just adding that to whatever the damage for the weapon is. Yeah. The broadsword without a thread is plus five. Mm -hmm. If you then have a thread that boasts the damage by one, that makes the mm -hmm. sword plus six plus whatever forge enhancements that you have. Yeah. They just stack with each other. I was going to say, they just continue to stack independently. So if you don't have one, you have the other. If you have both, they, they're, you know, nice. Add, add them all up. So you're good there. Okay. I'm going to get back to forging in just a second with his last question because it's a longer one. So in the meantime, can a human who learns spellcasting as a versatility talent have a friend attune a matrix item for them, allowing them to cast a spell without actually learning the spell matrix talent or the appropriate thread weaving talent? No. <laughs> I'm looking at contortions answering that question. I had to think it through because the difficulty being is that a spell matrix item still requires a thread to be woven to it. Fair. If you do not have a thread woven to it, you can't interact with the matrix. Okay. So if your friend, if your, your magician friend is, has the thread woven to the item to be able to reattune it to put a matrix mm -hmm. in it, and you don't have a thread, you can't interact with that spell I, matrix, yeah. so you wouldn't be able yeah. to. If you, for whatever reason, have this, the matrix item, and you wove a thread to it, but your friend didn't, your friend doesn't have a connection to that matrix to allow them to reattune it. I'm pretty sure that most standard on-their-own matrix items, that is to say, not ones that are already part of another mm -hmm. thread item, like that you sometimes get with like a magical staff, where the rank one power is it has a matrix but then you get yeah. other stuff. Those can have multiple threads woven to them. If both individuals have a thread woven to the item, then I would probably allow it because then they're both investing legend points in the ability to do that. Fair. But that's the only way that I would allow it as it is a standard on its own matrix item 
only one person can have the thread woven to it. So that's either you or your companion. In either case, one or the other of you would not be able to interact with the thread uh, with the matrix item in order to interact with the matrix to be able to, to either reattune or to yeah. cast the spell. If you don't have the thread woven to it, you can't do anything about it. Done. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Generally speaking, I do just want to say, and I think we probably talked about this in some episode in the past. Fair. Generally speaking, if you want to be able to cast spells, play a spellcaster. Yeah, just easier. It's possible to pick up stuff through versatility to be able to cast spells. I don't think it's particularly efficient or worthwhile. And there are some spells that if you do it that way, you just won't be able to effectively use because some of them have things that are based on your magician circle. Mm, Right. You don't have a magician circle. That's not going to work for you. To effectively be a magician, you need spell casting. You need thread weaving. You need pattern craft. Mm. You probably want to have a matrix. That's four Mm -hmm. talents right there. Again, I feel that if you want to be a magician, if you want to be able to cast spells, play a discipline that casts fair. spells. Because you also, if you do it under versatility, you won't be able to spend karma on any of that yeah, stuff. Fair. There's a whole bunch of things that you miss out on. I mean, that's that's just me. I, I know, I'm sure there are people who have had a great time supplementing their regular stuff with a little bit of spell casting. But I probably would never play a character that would do that because if I want to cast spells, I'm just going to make a magician. Fair. So, uh, good on you for challenge accepted, but that's, yeah, just some people do that. Have, have at it. That that's kind of a sidebar to the whole thing. But just again, in general, if you're talking about a, a regular plain old matrix item, no, you can't have your magician friend put a spell in it that you are then able to cast. Okay. Fair. So, he is listening to the Forge Weapon episode. Now, this is uh, at least six weeks old, so sorry about that, dude. Uh, it has always seemed to me that the forging of an already existing weapon should consist of adjusting it to better fit the user. What size and shape of grip best fits Yornum Hire's hand? How does Gravlax the Tasty like the ba- blade balanced, etc., etc.? Therefore, the reason the sword you pick up off a dead Throlic soldier doesn't give you that plus 10 bonus shouldn't be because it was done more than a year ago. It should be because you're not that specific dead Throlic soldier for whose hand the personal fighting style was painstakingly adjusted for. I would even go so far as to say that a forged weapon picked up off a corpse, even the corpse of a friend or party member, might actually give minuses to any other user, but that might be a bridge too far. Same with armor. Armor, especially plate, has to be carefully fitted to its users so the joints hinge at the same point the user's joints do, so the edges don't chafe or poke, etc., etc. Forged armor is armor that has been so exquisitely tuned to its user's unique body that it provides them bonuses. Anyway, if I ever run a game, instead of just participating as a player, I'm pretty sure I'll do that as a house rule, because the talent as written frankly makes no sense to me logically. Michael. You're not necessarily wrong, Michael, but that's just a level of detail that I don't care for. (laughs) No, if that's the way that you want to skin it or the way that you want to view it, that's fine. But that's a level of, of simulation detail that I just don't care for. And if that's the way that you want to approach it, great. I don't necessarily think that that thought... I don't know. I don't necessarily think that you're wrong. We are talking about a magical talent here, however. So it is not simply just a case of physically altering the weapon a particular way. There is a certain amount of enchanting that is going into effect with that, in a sense. The mad, the, magical yeah, the magical MacGuffin. MacGuffin um, that it's basically a, a way, a magical ability, a way for bonuses and things to be increased for both weapons and armor. Yeah, from a logical standpoint, again, you're not wrong, but it's magic and it's a level of detail that I don't particularly care for. Things always tend to start falling apart in RPGs in general, but in Earth Dawn as well, when you start trying to apply what you logically think would happen and run into places where the rules seem to contradict that. There was actually a question 
earlier today or yesterday, like really recently in the Facet Games Discord, where somebody was asking about, can a mounted rider use two-handed weapons? Because there's nothing specifically in the rules that prohibits it. Mm -hmm. The sort of problem that comes across is, well, if you're wielding a two-handed weapon, how are you going to be controlling the mount? Without that actually being the question that is being asked. Yes. Yeah. That's what the implied question is. The assumption, the the unstated major premise, to use the logical term, is that <laughs> you need to have a hand free in order to control the horse. Therefore, you should not be able to wield two handed weapons as mm -hmm. part of mounted combat. Yeah. OK, great. Again, you're not necessarily wrong, except in the cases where you've got mounted lancers and they've got a lance in one hand and a shield in the other so they've got both hands and usually the reins are like held in one of those hands mm -hmm. again where I, I i'm not i'm not a professional knight i'm not an equestrian i've ridden horses but i've never jousted <laughs> it is a level of detail that i personally do not care that much for it is not really intended to be a simulation of the way things actually work because again you start bringing magic into it are you going to have different rules for a cavalryman who has a magical bond with their mount and may not even need to use reins in order to at all. control where their mount is going and a regular non-adept rider when we do have historical examples, perhaps, of people having used mm -hmm. two-handed weapons or having used two hands to do things, if you at your table say, this doesn't make any sense, I'm not going to allow it, and the group is fine with that, then that's Great. fine. No skin off my nose. It's just, if we tried to go through and make everything jive with the way, one, we Physics. wouldn't be able to satisfy everyone. No. <laughs> no. And two, the book's already beefy as they are would probably be about double the length as we put in all mm -hmm. of the special cases and exceptions and stuff like that. So yeah, the game rule legalese. So it's the way that things are. It was never stated in, especially when you're looking at stuff in, in the player's guide and the GM's guide. A lot of that is just bringing forward stuff from previous editions. It was not really rewritten to the extent that some of the later material is. And again, it's a level of detail that I personally don't care enough about. Yeah, I am I, much more I, of a, does it seem cool? All right. Great. I was just going to use that exact thing. This sounds like a really cool idea, or I can see this cinematically in my head going, I want the character to do this on screen that I'm watching because it would be really cool to see it happen. Roll it. Pull it off. Ultimately, Roll. when you are running a game, the game master makes the call based on what is being described based on the the narrative that is being woven in the ongoing conversation between players and gms with regards to what's happening in in the scene in the story or whatever the game master is the one that decides when a role ultimately should be called for mm -hmm. and if the gm decides that no in this cir circumstance you are a non-adept mundane rider i'm not going to allow you to wield a two-handed sword while you are riding because you need to have a hand free in order to hold the yeah. reins if you want to try and control where the mount's going to go i don't have a problem with that that is perfectly within the gm's purview to make those calls and, and those kinds of decisions yeah or I, I just do the ahead of time make your trick riding first to see if you can you know yeah. Keep the mount on track, then roll your you know, attack roll. And that's just the tools are there. Decide that you're how you're going to use them. We can't cover every possible situation and edge case. Some people may think, well, that's a pretty obvious situation that you might have wanted to specify. Uh, yeah. OK, great. You may think so. I don't happen to agree. Or it's just the, if you fail your trick writing, then you have a minus to your attack roll. If you succeed at your trick writing, you know, again, fine. you know, just that's a discussion that I personally don't care to get into. I'm not going to say mm -hmm. you're wrong if that's the way that you want to handle it. Yeah. Okay, great. So I kind of gave up on being that concerned with other people's games. <laughs> 
I'm old, man. I'm I'm going to be 50 in a month. I <laughs> <laughs> been around a while. <laughs> that is a debate that back in my 20s, I probably would have been the, been the hill you would die gone on. back and forth with great <laughs> vehemence on members of the uh, the the Earth Dawn email list, as I'm sure Lou may remember some of the discussions from back in the day. <laughs> I am a lot more chill Hello. about such things now. Yeah, fair. If that's the way you want to handle forged weapons and armor as a way of saying, well, this is why they are not mm -hmm. superlative, why there are not superlative weapons all over the place. OK, great. That's fine. That's your reason for, for why that's happened. Cool. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. Else goes along with it. You're good, man. It's your it's it's your Earth Dawn. Make it epic. So uh, wraps up our talk topic for today, all of those topics that we had in our talks. So by all means, don't wait six weeks to get us more emails. We were a long time and we're happy to be back. So by all means, drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, don't get too lost in the minutia of certain things. Just make it cinematic and make it epic. Good night, everybody. <laughs>